What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to College Football Talk with Peter Burtnett. In today's episode, I'm going to be going over my week one outlook, including predictions and all the top games from this upcoming week in college football. This is the week that everything kicks off, so let's get right into it. But before I do, if you go on to enjoy this video, please feel free to leave a like, consider subscribing to the channel, and turn on those post notifications so you're always up to date whenever I upload. But getting things started on Thursday night, both of the two games on Thursday that are the ones to watch are happening at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central, and for the other game, importantly, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. In that first game, North Carolina at Minnesota. This game's on ESPN. It's a tale of the running backs in this one. Omarion Hampton for the Tar Heels is one of the top running backs, probably in the ACC, if not nationally. Kirk Herbstreet even calling him one of the top running backs nationally in the Week Zero College Game Day from Dublin. Um, Darius Taylor for the Golden Gophers is also a top running back, one of the, uh, the best running backs, I would say, in the Big Ten. Certainly up there. Um... I don't know if he, he's obviously not quite to the level of the guys like Donovan Edwards, Quinchon Judkins, and Travion Henderson or Ohio State, um, or maybe even running backs like like the guys that are at Penn State, but he's certainly up there as a top running back. The Golden Gophers have a defense that returns seven starters. They were in the top half of top half of college football last year. But the Tar Heels have a top twenty offense that they're going to be going up against. However, they did have a porous defense at times. They were a little more in the bottom half defensively, allowing 163.2 yards per game against the rush. So that'll be important for them to be able to slow down uh, Darius Taylor for the Golden Gophers. But this Tar Heels team, I think their offense will be able to get enough done being, um, you know, having the productivity that they had last year. And I think the Tar Heels pull an upset in Minneapolis 30 to 27. Next up, it's the big one. It's the Coach Prime Show, North Dakota State at Colorado. Um, the Buffaloes are going to be going up against the team in the Bison, Buffalo and the Bison. This is a, an appropriate matchup for this region of the country where the game is happening. Um, if you know about Yellowstone, not far away, a lot, a lot of Bison there. Been there myself, and trust me, there are lots of Bison there. So will these Bison be able to invade Colorado's territory and be able to get the win? Obviously, Colorado's led by quarterback Shadur Sanders, who just signed a, a new Nike deal, and then wide receiver cornerback Travis Hunter. Um, North Dakota State's quarterback, Cam Miller, returns. Uh, he was a solid quarterback last year for the Bison, and Colorado's pass defense struggled at times last year, allowing 27, uh, 277 yards per game. I think this game is high scoring. I think Colorado gets a late touchdown. Maybe they're able to force a turnover. They were able to do a pretty good job of that last year, and I think gets a little bit more breathing room. I'm going to go with Colorado 45, North Dakota State 36. Maybe a few, few field goals to get there, or they go for two to get within a touchdown, and they don't get the conversion. Nine-point win for the Buffaloes. Then Friday night, a little bit of a sneaky game. Not going to spend too much time on this one. 10.30 p.m. Eastern, so a lot of people on the East Coast, except for college, true college football sickos, are going to be watching this one, 7.30 on the Pacific Coast. TCU at Stanford. This is the Cardinals' first game as a full-fledged member of the ACC. They've got a really good wide receiver in Elik Aomanor, who was uh, an 1,000-yard receiver last year. TCU, the, the Horned Frogs had some uncertainty at quarterback in the spring as their incumbent starter, Josh Hoover, dealt with some injuries, but he's back. Their passing attack last year ranked 7th nationally with 312.2 yards per game. However, like I said, their defense struggled against the pass a little bit. Elik Ayomanor put up a lot of yards alongside quarterback Ashton Daniels. I think Stanford can actually get the ball moving. I think they can put up some points. And this is a tough game for Sonny Dyke's TCU team to go on the road against the Cardinal, who I think are able to pull a little bit of a an, a home upset, are able to get a 38-34 to 34 win and get some momentum started as they head into ACC play. I think they're going to find it a challenge this year, but I think this is the sort of game that they could win, and I'm going to call the upset in this one. Then moving into Saturday with the noon window, I'm going to start things out with the big game here in this window, number 14 Clemson versus number one Georgia at Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta. The, I think, Chick-fil-A kickoff, if that's what it's still called. 
Tigers last year had a top 10 defense. However, just three of their starters from last year return. The key in that is going to be the linebacker, Barrett Carver, who's one of the top defensive players in the country. And then true freshman, a five-star linebacker, Sammy Brown. So those two guys in that middle of the unit are going to be really important and I think are going to be key in potentially keeping the Tigers in this game. But they have a really tough test against a Georgia team that ranked top 10 in offense, led by Carson Beck, and top 10 in defense with safety, Malachi Starks being kind of the player to watch there. The question is, can this Clemson team make strides offensively? They total just over 400 yards per game and ranked 60th nationally. It's going to be the second year under Cade Klubnick as the starting quarterback. Phil Maffa comes in at running back for Will Shipley. How will he plug in to, to that situation? I think, I think Clemson has a bit too many questions to answer. Georgia has some as well. Don't get me wrong. They have a lot of guys who are young and to this point unproven in game experience in the secondary, but I do think Georgia... Georgia has enough, and I think they are able to win comfortably in the end. Clemson might keep it close for a half, maybe three quarters, but I think Georgia gets a 31 to 17 win. Then next up, this is a game I think is probably the best bid for an upset. It's the number eight Penn State Nittany Lions going in to Morgantown to face the West Virginia Mountaineers. Um, the passing yards per game for this Nittany Lions team is going to need to improve. Drew Aller was incredibly efficient and accurate last year with 25 touchdowns to just two interceptions, but his yardage was not very high. They do have some good running backs led by Katron Allen in the backfield and Nick Singleton, but they're going to need to, I think, make some strides this year in terms of the passing game if they want to compete against the likes of Oregon and Ohio State. Um, the Mountaineers were the number three rushing offense, but this Penn State defense ranked top five nationally. They were the best in the country versus the run. So this is, I think it could be a really good matchup in the trenches because you're going to see West Virginia's offensive line and their running backs and, and quarterback Garrett Green, who can run the ball, go up against the Penn State defense that was the best in the country in stopping the run a year ago. So you're going to have number three, in rushing offense against number one in rush defense, I think that's going to be a really fun matchup to watch and something to keep an eye on on uh, at 11 a.m. Central Time, 12 noon uh, Eastern Time on Fox. It's going to be big noon kickoff. We're going to have Gus Johnson and Joel Klatt on the call. I think it's going to be a very entertaining game to watch in that area. Those two guys for West Virginia in the backfield, C.J. Donalds Donaldson and Jaheim White, combined for almost 1,600 yards and 24 touchdowns, but they will, again, face a really stiff test against the Nittany Lions. I think home field advantage does prove valuable for the Mountaineers, but I think Penn State is able to get enough stops in this game, including maybe one late in the game. Maybe it's fourth down. Maybe it's fourth and goal at the one, that sort of situation where West Virginia needs to punch it in for a touchdown, and they're stopped just short by this Penn State defense. I'm going Penn State 27, West Virginia 20. A big road win for the Nittany Lions to get their season and started then one game kind of a standalone game here i don't even know if it's on national tv it might be one of those espn plus big 12 games but it's 2 p.m eastern 1 p.m central time the fcs champions back to back south dakota state at number 17 oklahoma the jack rabbits are back to back champions in the fcs um, but can they stop the the, the top running back ollie gordon from oklahoma state and the passing attack led by Alan Bowman, which ranked in the top 25 nationally last year. I think that's the question. They've got a proven quarterback, the Jackrabbits do. The Walter Payton winner from last year, which goes to the top offensive player in the FCS quarterback, Mark Gronowski. Not Gronkowski. <laughs> Key, key difference there. Um, and, and with that, you know, you have the top offensive player from the level below coming in. Um, going up against an OSU defense that ranked 123rd against the pass. So I think that's going to be vitally important, that matchup to watch. How will the Oklahoma State secondary be able to go up against the Oklahoma uh, or against the Jackrabbits passing attack? An FCS Power 5 upset has, has happened most years, not including 2020 for I think the last decade or so. The last uh, FCS win over a ranked team came in 2021 when Montana beat number 20 Washington. That that was not a very good Washington team. They kind of collapsed near the end of the season, then they bounced the back hugely, obviously two years later, to make the championship game last year. But this is a key matchup. 
I think Oklahoma State has just enough to get a big win. South Dakota State went undefeated last year. They did not play a Power 5, or maybe even, I don't even think they played an FBS opponent last year. Um, they ran through their schedule. I think they get their first loss in quite a while. I'll, I'll pop up here when the last time they lost was, but it's been at least... A, you know, two years since the 2022 season, if not longer. I'll have to double check on that. My prediction here is Oklahoma State 37, South Dakota State 33. Then at 3.30, there's only really one big game. It's number 19, Miami, Florida, at the Florida Gators. The Hurricanes offensive trio of Cam Ward, Damian Martinez, and Xavier Restrepo, I think is going to be really exciting to watch this year. But this is the first game for both Ward and Martinez with the Hurricanes since transferring in from um, Washington State and Oregon State. So how will those guys kind of plug in? We know Restrepo is a, is a talented weapon at wide receiver. So how will he pair with both of these two guys? Um, I, th I think the answer is pretty well. The Florida defense is solid, but I think the Hurricanes will be able to pick up some yards and some points in this one. Um, the Gators have an, an efficient, very efficient quarterback. Top last year in the SEC in completion percentage, Graham Mertz. The question is, will running back Montreal Johnson Jr. start or even play? That seems to still be kind of up in the air. And then who's behind him? Obviously, last year, a key part of the Gators rushing attack, Trevor Etienne, is now at Georgia. So if Johnson can't play, who's going to step up for the Gators in the backfield? I think that's the question to answer for them. The Hurricanes last year were a top 40 offense and defense last year. On the defensive side of the ball, to, the one to watch for the Canes is defensive end Ruben Bain Jr., who has emerged as a really good young player for Miami. My prediction in this one, number 19 Miami, 24, Florida, 20. I think this is a close game. It's, it's a tough place to go and win for the Hurricanes in the swamp. I think the Gators are able to keep it close, but I do think the Hurricanes are able to pull out a big win. Then the night capper. This, I would say, is probably the most marquee matchup. Number seven, Notre Dame at number 20, Texas A&M, 7.30 Eastern, 6.30 Central Time. The question here is how will Riley at Leonard at Notre Dame as the quarterback and Mike Elko, the new head coach at A&M, adjust to their new homes? Um, you know, how will they plug in there? This is a big test for both of those guys to kind of prove it. You know, Marcus Freeman has shown that he's a solid coach. I think this is still kind of a prove-it game for him as a head coach, but I do think Riley Leonard especially, this is a big game for him going into a really hostile environment at Kyle Field. And, of course, Mike Elko has a chance for that home crowd, the 12th man at in College Station, to, to show, hey, this is, this is what you can expect from me as the new head coach. We could beat a top-10 Notre Dame team. So there are huge questions to answer for both of these teams. What are some of the key areas to watch, though? Um, Notre Dame had a top 10 defense and they have 13 interceptions from last year returning Benjamin Morrison and Xavier Watts are two of the guys I think have combined for 16 interceptions over their career last year they're two of the guys among a group that that had 13 interceptions I think as a unit maybe they had like 16 or something like that so they have most of that production in terms of forcing turnovers coming back that's important the defense overall has five starters coming back and then the offense has a bit of a new look. I think they only have two starters coming back and including Riley Leonard coming in at quarterback, but they were a top 30 offense last year. So can they uh, maintain that level of productivity? AM was a top 30 passing offense and did pretty well in terms of moving the ball, but their main issue was their inability to stop pressure. They allowed 35 quarterback hits last year, which was second worst in FBS behind Nevada. So how will they fare against the Notre Dame rush? Are they going to be able to slow that down enough? They did also have a top 25 defense and ranked 13th against the rush. So I think this could be a little bit of a defensive battle here um, as you're getting, you know, new quarterback trying to work in for Notre Dame, a, a good secondary for Notre Dame as well, going up against Connor Wiegman and the Aggies passing attack. I think Notre Dame, though, is able to to get that pressure, get that pressure there against an AM team that that was kind of their weakness last year. I think they're maybe able to force a couple of couple of picks, I think. And I think the Fighting Irish get out of uh, College Station with a 23 to 20 win. Finally, game coming on Sunday is number 23 USC versus number 13 LSU at Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 5.30 Mountain Time. Question is here, pair of new quarterbacks in this game who have both shown some promise 
one in both kind of in very limited um sample sizes miller moss last year looked really good in the holiday bowl with six touchdowns against louisville who's obviously last year's acc runners up and then garrett nussmeyer at lsu when he was able to plug in did pretty well for the tigers again both in very limited i think nussmeyer had something like four touchdowns to one interception last year throwing for somewhere in like three to four hundred yards or something like that um, so both of these guys have taken snaps. They've played in some games. Moss, you know, obviously playing in a bowl game, I think is big. But the question is for both of these guys, how are they gonna how are they gonna fare? <laughs> they might not have too stiff of a challenge because both of these passing defenses ranked in the bottom twenty five nationally last year. So the question is, how will they both improve? Whichever one was able to improve more over the off season, I think will have the upper hand. Obviously, there's no way to really see that until we see it in game. So that's the question for these pass defenses. Who is able to make the you know make the stops, make the big plays, potentially even forcing turnovers to be able to get the upper hand in this game? This is a really important game. Both of these teams have tough schedules. Later on in their schedule, USC has both Michigan and Penn State. I will say outside of that, so they have two big games. Outside of that, it's a little bit easier. Um, but this game is huge. I think USC is probably going to have to go, you know, 10-2 and two with losses in those two games that I mentioned to Michigan and Penn State. Um, so I think that means they probably have to win this game. LSU is kind of in a similar similar boat here. They have, I think, an even tougher, obviously, schedule in the SEC. Uh, I think the SEC is bigger than the Big Ten. The top teams are right on par with the SEC's best, I think. You know, Ohio State, Oregon, maybe Penn State and Michigan. Um but I think the the lower level, it's it's not as deep in the Big Ten versus the SEC. You really do have tough games almost week in and week out. So LSU probably as well needs to get a win in this one. I don't think the loser of this game is done, um, especially because this is a non-conference game. If either of these teams can make a run in conference and pick up a couple of big wins, even if they lose this one, they still have a chance to be that conference champion. But this game is huge. To make a prediction, though, in this one, I think LSU is able to do just a little bit more on offense. USC, I think, just doesn't quite have enough to win this one. I'm going to go LSU 42 and USC 35. But that is all for week one rundown. I guess another question, Monday night, will Florida State be able to get back on track as they play at Doe Campbell Stadium against Boston College in the Monday game? But that's all for this episode. Let me know your predictions for each of these games. And maybe if there's a game that I didn't mention that you think is an important one to watch, comment that below. But if you've stuck around at this point in the video, thank you so much for watching College Football Talk. I'm your host, Peter Burnett, signing out. Peace.